starting in one minute guys Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to this deep webinar. Thank you all for joining us on a Friday evening. I am Suyash Desai, your host for today's deep webinar and a researcher at the Takshashila Institution. I research on China's defense and foreign policies, international relations and strategic studies. For those who are new to this uh, institution, the Takshashila Institution, here's a quick introduction on who we are and what we do. The Takshashila Institution is an independent center for research and education in public policy. It is a non-partisan think tank concerned with how India shapes the world and how world shapes India in return. We are also a policy focused school. Uh, we are focused on transforming how India is governed and exploring the intersection between politics, technology policy and public economics. Uh, today, we are thrilled to be joined by Rahul Das for the launch of his latest book, The Blue Elephant. Uh, the book dives deep into how India must boost its soft power. Uh, before we dive deep into the conversation about India's soft power, uh, let me introduce Rahul a bit. Uh, Rahul graduated as a computer engineer and began his career working in Cambodia and Malaysia before moving to India to work as a consulting firm in a consulting firm in Bangalore. He's a Takshashila alum and the book Blue Elephant marks his debut as an author. The book is inspired by the observations made during his travels across different parts of the world. And the book deals with the concept of soft power and how India can forward uh, its national interest. So welcome Rahul, uh, we are, it's our pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you so much Suyash. Uh, am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes, you are. All right, sure. Uh, uh, so thanks. Yeah. So before we start, just a word on the today's format that we are using. It's called Deep Webinar. Uh, these are thoughtfully curated conversations that bring together both great panelists and great discussions on a single platform. Uh, we also take audience Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, today's session would be for around 60 to 75 minutes. And at the end, I'll try to keep 10 to 15 minutes for audience Q&A. Uh, before beginning the conversation, I would also like to add that these deep webinars, in these deep webinars, discussions are really at the heart of the conversation. So we have three discussions today. Our first discussion is Priya Ravichandran. Priya has been a student and, and an analyst in the field of politics and policy making for the last 14 years. Her interest lies in the intersection of constitution making and political history. And she's currently working, she's currently working as a marketer. Uh, with a leading, re leading retail company in Bangalore, uh, Chennai. Our second discussant is Rishi Trivedi. Rishi is an entrepreneur, a founder, and a CEO of Anamind, Advanced Analytical Planning Firm. And more importantly, he is an, also an alum of the Takshashila Institution. And finally, we have Anand Ayaduri, who is a founder and CEO of Vogo, the largest scooter sharing company in India, and also an alum of the Takshashila Institution. A warm welcome to all of you guys. Uh, so great, we have a good set of people for what I believe would be an insightful conversation and an intelligent discussion on India's soft power. So without wasting any further time, I want to start this conversation with you, Rahul. Uh, the discussion today on India's soft power is greatly inspired by your work uh, on uh, your latest book, The Blue Elephant. Uh, 
I would like to just to get everyone on board. I would like to add start with three basic questions to you. Uh, one, what inspired you to write this book? Two, how do you look at the concept of soft power? And three, how what role do you think soft power plays in forwarding India's national interest? Rahul. Right. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Suyash, and uh, thanks, uh, Rishi, Anand, uh, Soumya, Atesh, Priya, for being a part of the session. Um, before I go to the details of what you've just discussed, so you've spoken about uh, what is my inspiration behind the book, um, how what I think of soft power, and how India can use the soft power for its national interests. Right. So uh, before all that, I just want to thank everybody for being part of the session. Um, everyone who's, who's who's been a part of this, I think there are many participants that we have right now. And uh, I know it's a Friday evening and you'd rather wrap up all your work and start the three-day weekend, but you've chosen to be here. And that obviously means a lot to me. Um, and so thank you again, once again. So I will start with talking about the story behind the book, um, how it came about, what was the source of my inspiration, right? Um, I started working on the book about a year and a half ago. And when I did start, I didn't exactly have uh, the intention to end up publishing a book. Uh, all I had thought about back then was just to focus on the individual essays that are part of the book right now. Uh, individual essays that's, that, that detail uh, each specific source of India's soft power. And these are all based on my experiences where I would sort of merge, uh, weave my experiences with some of the topics that I had read about soft power. Uh, or international relations. Um, that was my aim when I started to write. I really had no end goal in mind. But at some point, and um, this had happened around last October, um, I was going through all the essays and I realized that I had written about 25,000 words. And then I did some basic Googling and I realized that a 200 page book usually has around 50,000 words. And I was halfway there. And that's when I realized that I could, if I just pushed myself a little bit, I could probably, you know, go the distance. And I still had uh, thoughts. I still had some ideas and experiences that I wanted to share. And I think around October was the time when I decided to, uh, you know, just uh, do it full time and actually publish a full fledged book. And this, interestingly, had coincided with uh, when I had done my three month course at Takshashila, and. Um, there is something about the environment in Takshashila that, that motivated me to, to, to go the distance. I met many interesting people, smart, well-read, uh, all with very good intentions, um, chill people, very fun-loving, who just love to bounce ideas off each other. And I think that is also uh, the reason why we're here today, right, doing this webinar. And I love the space that you guys had, very smack in the middle of the city, beautifully done, conducive to all these conversations that I found so interesting. I really loved my experience there. So I pushed myself for a few more months and early this year I was ready and I had all my content ready and uh, the book is the product that we finally have right now. Uh, so when I look back, of course, the writing process might have started a year and a half ago, but I think the seeds for that were sown way before that. Um, so uh, something about me is that I grew up in Malaysia. I moved to India when I was very young. And at that point, the culture shock that I was faced with uh, sort of made me look at India and experience India with a different perspective, which was something that I might probably not have done had I not been thrown into that position. So I have been, uh, I've, I've been part of this journey where I've seen myself progress from someone who has considered himself as an outsider in India to someone who has ended up writing a book about India. And it's been a wonderful journey for me. And I've also had an interest in politics and world affairs, uh, not powerful enough for me to pursue it full-time. I'm an engineer, uh, but it is something that I've always had a very strong fascination for. Uh, but as Suyash mentioned in, in, in his introduction, I think the most powerful source of inspiration that I had was through my backpacking experiences. I have loved backpacking. I've, I've been to a few countries here and there, and I try to um, go, go on trips where I've been on the you know beaten track, so to speak, uh, to places that have been completely outside my comfort zone. 
and i've loved observing how people would treat me and look at me when i would visit all these places and i realized that uh, all their perspectives were influenced by what they knew already about india by their pre existing ideas about india that's how they would look at me and this observation this uh, this learning that i was experiencing coincided with all the reading that i was doing about software and it was just experiential learning at its finest for me i think that was the journey that i went through so i'll share uh, one story which is something that i've mentioned in the book as well in uh, the last chapter of hollywood um i was again working in kuala lumpur working in malaysia back then and uh, the good thing about living in kl is that air asia air asia flights from kl are unbelievably uh, cheap to other places in southeast asia very cheap tickets so you can just randomly pick a three day weekend and decide to go to another country and um, i had one of those three day weekends and i decided to go to brunei and brunei was uh, basically everyone told me not to go there because it is supposed to be one of the most boring places to visit according to what i had heard back then and that uh, i think all the negative reviews that i heard sort of made me want to go to brunei even more and i ended up going there so i reached i was in brunei and i spent a day roaming around brunei um i noticed that the country basically had no nightlife no culture really that was interesting uh, the capital shuts down before dusk uh, the city has these huge mosques huge palaces and museums that 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 honor um, its its ruler the sultan but it felt very weird because it has a very tiny population and you have these huge roads uh, absent vehicles i just felt like i was in a ghost town and i felt very bored there so i decided to uh, go on a boat to one of the villages that were uh, away from the capital right and uh, so the next day i went on one of these boats a uh, very beautiful journey where you had all these vegetation both sides uh, of the river and i reached uh, a village uh, which is quite far from the city and i got down over there you know explored the village for a while and i was hungry so i entered this tiny cafe that was there and it was managed by somebody uh, who was who looked my age and minutes into our conversation with my broken malay uh, she started to tell me about you know her life and and about living in brunei and at this point there was a monkey that that entered the room right? and uh, she looked at me and she was like why aren't you praying to it and i was slightly taken aback i didn't understand what exactly she was referring to but later i realized that she had watched bajrangi bhaijaan and she had watched salman khan actually praying to all the monkeys in the movie and she somehow assumed that this is what all indians did right and again i saw somebody projecting her idea or her opinion about india uh, onto me and this was one of the many aha moments that i had uh, when i was i mean while, while traveling and while exploring different places uh, so there are plenty of stories i'm sure that you know many of you would also have similar stories and uh, basically this is the time when i started to grasp the extent of the influence of um, india's soft power so what i'll do is uh, for the benefit of the audience i will just briefly share my understanding of soft power because there are just so many definitions out there and it is you can argue that it is quite vague the concept right um, my understanding of soft power is that if you drill it down to the absolute basic it is charisma applied at a national level that is what soft power is uh, for my understanding so if you take the us for example the us is a classic illustration of soft power uh, the us is the world's flag bearer for freedom it's the oldest democracy it's supposedly meritocratic has the best universities in the world everybody talks about the american dream um, we've all been sold the idea that we can make it big if we go to the us and then there's this hollywood of course which has captured all our ima- imaginations across the globe there's english which is the world's lingua franca uh, there are companies like apple nike mcdonalds google um, and these serve as not just successful companies or brands they are symbols that reinforce the idea that america is the greatest place on earth likewise france has its cuisine australia has its sports uh, japan has anime south korea has kpop the uk has the bbc uh, there are so many examples of countries which have incredibly strong sources of soft power 
So likewise, what is India Hub? Right? We have plenty of resources. And in the book, what I've done is I've dedicated each chapter to um, each of the sources of our software. For example, we have Bollywood, which is one of the most successful film industries in the world. Uh, we have Cuisine, which is just so varied, so appealing, so delicious. Uh, we have one of the largest and the most influential overseas communities through our diaspora. We have cricket. We have a rising English speaking middle class, which basically implies that our scientists, our researchers, our doctors, our tourists can all interact with people in different countries. And this is all related to our culture. And even if you look at our political values, right? We are diverse, we are a populous uh, democracy. We were, we were born out of uh, non-violent struggle uh, against our oppressors. Uh, we have traditionally been non-aligned. We haven't really interfered with uh, the internal affairs of any other countries. And we've had a very pacifist foreign policy that way. So ideally, um, India basically has all the ingredients that should make us at least a soft power superpower. But if you look at the soft power 30 index, which is uh, supposedly the most cited source for global soft power rankings, India is nowhere in the list. We are not in the top 30, we are nowhere there. And even China, which is at least currently, after everything that's happening right now, uh, a country that is perceived as being untrustworthy, even China is part of the list. But why, why isn't India there? So clearly there is a lot of potential, but we are far behind where we ideally should be. So um, moving on, I would say, uh, so yeah, you had spoken briefly about how we can use soft power for our national interest, right? Um, I would just share a few thoughts about that. Um, I think uh, the, the world that we live in right now, we live in a multipolar world uh, where there is no clear global leader. And you could argue that it would make sense for every country in the world to move from or to us, India specifically, it would make sense for us to move from being non-aligned to being multi-aligned, right? And also it doesn't make sense for us to just pick one side and probably form a military alliance with it. That is not how the world is gonna work anymore. Which means that at the absence of alliances and collaborations and relationships at the very top, it is the middle levels of society where we should be focusing our energy. And this is where we should be really building our relationships with other countries. And this is exactly where soft power comes into the picture. So to share uh, an excellent example, I would cite Afghanistan. Um, when in 2001, when the Taliban government had fallen in 2001, the Indian foreign minister, then foreign minister, Jaswant Singh, he had visited Kabul. And he didn't visit Kabul with, uh, with food or with arms or any other things that you can think of. He visited Kabul in a plane which is filled with tapes of Bollywood, music, of Bollywood movies and music. And all these tapes were quickly distributed across the city. So that is uh, an example of somebody using, of an official, uh, an elected official using soft power for our national interest. Additionally, we can also look at the other things that India has done with respect to Afghanistan. Uh, India has used cricket very well when it comes to Afghanistan. We've provided the Afghan team with training facilities. We've helped them build a cricket stadium. And we were also the first country to have played a test match with them, which was huge considering the fact that Afghanistan wasn't probably even ready for test cricket. But we stepped in and we ensured that they had that opportunity. Likewise, um, Afghanistan's former president, Hamid Karzai, he had studied in India. He had studied in the Himachal University. And since his reign in Afghanistan, ties with India have been reasonably good. Uh, so what all this basically means is that irrespective of what is happening in Afghanistan right now with the US pulling out from Afghanistan, our soft power there will always remain. And if we can combine that, uh, that, that goodwill, the goodwill that we have over there with sound military and economic strategies, we will be able to achieve our national interest goals there. Uh, so that is my introduction. So Yash, I, I hope that I have answered uh, the questions that you had spoken about. And, Thanks, uh, sure. Thank, thank so, you so much, Rahul. I, this is a unique way of how you have approached and how you are approaching this interdisciplinary study of forwarding India's national interest and achieving strategic autonomy using software. This is very unique. And thank you for uh, the insightful uh, opening remarks. Uh, now I would like to come to Priya. 
Priya, I think you have some observations on how soft power is used by different countries in the world, and you also have a subsequent question on pre and on post pandemic use of soft power, right? Would you like to come in to this right now? Yeah, are you able to hear me? Am I audible? Um, awesome. Um, thanks, Rahul. That that the book was really fantastic, and uh, Indian foreign policy is richer thanks to you know contributions like yours. Um, I had uh, three thoughts on uh, three thoughts that uh, came out of reading your book, and uh, also questions that uh, perhaps we might be able to discuss as a group together. Um, and broadly, three points. One, we are no longer in a world which is divided cleanly into protagonists and antagonists like it was during the cold war era and you know there were very clearly people on one side and people on uh, the other side even in the example that you speak about in the book with uh, pakistan and china, uh, us and china just uh, during the 1970s um, it has changed a lot the world has changed a lot i'm sure sure there are um, still you know, issues here and there, but for the most part, people agree on, uh, there are avenues where people can come together and discuss a lot of these things. So do you think given the circumstances, we should be able to think about soft power differently than how it was defined by Nai in the 1980s or, uh, you know, how it has functioned till now? what kind of soft power works and what kind um, is usually less impactful than the other. That is one point that I had in mind. Uh, the other one was um, you covered a lot, your book covers a lot of how nations can forward their, um, their can forward themselves through tasks, through um, uh, various uh, fields um, through the sports or Bollywood or um, any of those things. There are um, two things there. One, um, I think states are a far, states by themselves are far more equipped to handle soft power rather than national at the national level, because this also brings up another point that you make in your book about how there has to be cultural uh, cohesion when, or a cultural a single cultural um, idea that a nation has to forward, put forward when it comes to um, um, a pro a propagation of soft, uh, pro talking about soft power as uh, at a national level, which is difficult for a country like India and even the US at uh, some level, it's not the easiest thing to speak in one language, uh, literally and figuratively. And uh, states I think are, probably far more equipped. I mean, we have the case of Kerala, uh, you know, and, and uh, its relationship with many countries in the Middle East. And we have uh, the case of a lot of our Northeast countries having a far better relationship with our Southeast Asian neighbors rather than India itself. So I think that is a case to be made for um, that. And um, I think the third point that I wanted to bring up is um, you mentioned now and in your book about the soft power index. And uh, one of the things that I've come across during uh, my own readings about the soft power index was that it is uh, based on a per capita basis and not uh, really on any other solid measure which India would be able to pass. I mean, there are questions that you can ask, uh, is per capita basis still a valid measure of uh, how to measure soft power? Uh, but the other point that I wanted to also bring up that is that India's uh, soft power has been mostly privately driven rather than um, publicly driven for, uh, you know, or government driven, like the uh, your examples of Bollywood um, or cricket, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, but Bollywood cricket or uh, any of the other cultural factors that we are known for in other countries are more from how private uh, industries or private uh, people have uh, have had an impression upon uh, locals in other uh, countries rather than something that has been consciously driven by the government, the federal government, and uh, from um, um, towards a single goal. So I think 
Um, this also plays into how um, states, why states should uh, take on uh, the role of uh, talking about soft power rather than nations. But uh, these are three points that I think I broadly had while reading your book and it's something that, uh, you know, I like to discuss a little bit more and you know and given your travel in southeast asia you probably are at a better place to say how uh, india's reach and how india's reach as far as soft power as uh, um, goes has actually translated into policy or you know shifts in uh, uh, shifts in what south asia thinks of what southeast asian countries think about india and how they have uh, changed their policy to uh, suit our um, needs a lot more. Thanks, Priya. I mean, that's so very insightful and it's a lot of comments. So thank you so much. Um, I will uh, add to some of the things that you've just mentioned. Um, I think one of the first things that you mentioned was how has uh, the definition of soft power changed? When Nye had, Joseph Nye, by the way, is the person who's introduced the term soft power um, for the benefit of everybody. Um, he had introduced it in 1990. And in 2004, he ended up writing a book called Soft Power. And uh, that's how Soft Power has just become so popular these days. Um, so you mentioned how Soft Power, uh, the definition of Soft Power itself has changed over the last few decades. Um, in my opinion, I think that the biggest change that has happened is the rise of the internet. And uh, when Nye had defined Soft Power back in 1990, uh, there was no internet. And the way we used to communicate with with, with each other was completely different. Back then, I think ideas were just restricted to uh, a company's borders, uh, sorry, a country's borders, and uh, more specifically to maybe its elites, that's it. And it was public opinion was controlled or at least highly influenced by um, individual opinions in that tiny segment of the population. But today, you know, data is ubiquitous and uh, public opinion is changing. I think it is becoming um, a more equal composition of individual opinions. So I think that is the biggest change. Like for instance, um, you can argue that trolls probably have the same amount of soft power that, that, that an elected official can have, right? So that is a huge change that has happened over the last few decades. Um, in addition to that, I think when, when Nye had introduced the concept in the 90s um, or around the 80s, that basically the number of democracies in the world has been rising over the last few decades. Uh, in the 80s and the 90s, the number of democracies that we had was in the hundreds, but now it's I think, around 150. So what that has done is it has made software all the more relevant because if you as a country are dealing with another country where, uh, which is a democracy and uh, where power is distributed amongst the population rather than being confined to um, the hands of the elite, uh, the ability of your ability to engage with the other country depends on your ability to engage with the citizens in that country as well. So that is another change that has happened. And uh, in addition to that, I think in the 2000s, we, we were in this period where uh, there's rapid globalization, rapid economic growth, and things have changed right now, I mean, especially with COVID in the picture. Um, we have come to a point where Societies are getting more polarized. There's rising nationalism everywhere. Uh, military expenditure is rising. There is no clear global leadership anymore. And I just feel that uh, we need to focus on the things that unite us more than divide us. And soft power um, serves that purpose because it is uh, definitely a very relatively inclusive uh, source of power. So uh, that is about the evolution. Another thing that you had spoken about was uh, Southeast Asia. And Southeast Asia is obviously uh, <laughs> a region that I'm very interested in because I have a personal connection uh, with Southeast Asia. And uh, what's interesting is that it is a region with which we in India have many similarities uh, with them, both historically, culturally, um, in terms of folk dances, in terms of the scripts uh, that, that both our regions have. Um, there is this popular pop music uh, genre in Indonesia called Dangdut. And that is, they, they borrowed a lot from Bollywood and Bollywood has also borrowed from them. So there's this, uh, you know, we, we all have similar cultures. If you look at the languages that, that, uh, that, that exist in Southeast Asia. So I speak a little bit of Malay. And what's interesting to note is that many of the words in Malay are Sanskrit loan words. So Putri means a princess in Malay. 
Vanita is woman. Shri is a very commonly uh, used term. And the irony is um, Bhumiputra, which basically means sons of the soil, which is used to refer uh, to the Malays who live in Malaysia, is actually a Sanskrit loan word, Bhumiputra. Uh, Pradhana Mantri means prime minister. So there are a lot of um, examples that we can come up with this way. Um, Islam in Southeast Asia was supposed to have been spread through Muslim traders in India. Um, and, and again, we can just keep coming up with examples. But the point is, there is so much that we have had uh, with Southeast Asia, historically, culturally. Um, but I would argue that, um, again, you know, compared to where we could be, I think we are nowhere uh, where we should be. Because, um, and in terms of the, some of the policies that the government has made, so I think there have been policies at the top. Um, India is definitely engaged with ASEAN. Um, I think there are multiple student exchange programs. There are uh, these car rallies, which basically have uh, the, the fleet of cars driving from Singapore all the way to New Delhi. Uh, so that's another you know, PR exercise that they've done. Uh, there are ASEAN India centers. The Indian Council for Cultural Relations has done a lot in this regard. And even uh, a couple of years ago, during our Republic Day, we had invited all the 10 leaders from ASEAN, right? That was uh, 10 leaders attending the Republic Day Parade. So there has been a lot, um, there have been a lot of initiatives that have started from the top, but it just feels like at the middle, there really hasn't been uh, much because one, one uh, example can be um, tourism, right? So if, let's say, like looking at it from a Southeast Asian perspective, if you are a citizen from there and if you have explored the culture and the history that happens there, you would ideally have a curiosity for what happens in India because you'd want to explore what, uh, what, 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 what India has. But if you look at all our inbound tourist rankings, um, the only country that is, in the, that is in the top 10 is Malaysia. And that again, you can argue that that's because of Malaysians who have family ties in India. And it's probably not because of soft power that, that, that we have. So overall, um, it just feels like um, there is a lot that we can do. Collaborations, uh, not, to, not just in terms of culture, but also IT, commerce, education. I mean, there's so many different fields that we can collaborate with the Southeast Asians. Um, there's also something that I wanted to share uh, with regard to this, since we've mentioned Southeast Asia. Um, there is always a risk. I mean, when you engage with another country, you sort of, and when you use culture to assume with, uh, to, to engage with another country, I think there is a risk that uh, you overdo it sometimes. In the sense, like I'll just share an example. If India has to work with uh, countries in, in Southeast Asia, uh, we can use culture to work with countries like Thailand, Cambodia, and Indonesia. But it probably wouldn't be such a good idea if, uh, if you work with Malaysia because Malaysian politics, current politics, uh, tends to focus a lot, a lot on the racial fault lines that exist in the country. And um, a lot of their history has, they, they've done uh, their best to sort of disassoci dis dissociate themselves with, uh, uh, with their uh, Indian cultural heritage. So we need to be cognizant of what the other country wants from us and uh, tailor our approaches uh, to them accordingly. I think that, that's, that's what I wanted to share. Thanks, thanks, Rahul. That was a fascinating insight on India's soft power. Off, my, off the top of my head, I could think of two things when you were uh, speaking. One, regarding the spread of Ramayana from yes. India to Southeast Asia. The South, Southeast Asia, the ASEAN countries have their own version of Ramayana, where the protagonists and antagonists are different from India. And uh, second one, the ASEAN diplomacy. Uh, one of the stronger points, in fact, about ASEAN is their central focus on uh, cultural tourism and soft power. But yes, as you said, I agree with you that things are in the center and it needs to improve. Uh, I, I would like to move on from uh, Priya to Rishi. Uh, Rishi, I think you have some observations on the role of soft power in India-Pakistan dispute, right? I am especially interested in what you have because I've never heard soft power playing a role in India-Pakistan dispute uh, with hard power playing such a major role. Would you like to come in and give some insight and ask a question on that? Rishi? Yes, Vash. Uh, are you able to hear me, Rahul? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. All right. So uh, before I come to uh, Indo-Pak, I would like to first of all congratulate uh, Rahul for a wonderful uh, book on a topic which is, uh, I would say, less explored until now um, since uh, Joseph Nye uh, coined the term. And maybe because it's, uh, it has less jingoism uh, compared to the political and the military um, power. 
right? And I also want to give you Rahul a, a feedback on the book, um, of things I like for the benefit of the people who might not have uh, read it. Uh, first thing, what I liked about the way you have structured it, uh, and you have for all the sources that you have um, highlighted as uh, potential for India soft power, you have also ended the chapters with a way forward. And in a sense, which is uh, you have defined the how of it, right? Because there's a lot of talk and people, including Shashi Tharoor has, uh, you know, uh, spoken about it in TED Talk. But uh, one wonders how to really implement, uh, because this is not a structured, um, uh, you know, topic. So that is something very good. Uh, second is there is a book is uh, full of a lot of uh, information of relating the uh, you know smaller incidences um, where the country's soft power has played in uh, in in the strategic objectives right and this has uh, the the best example something i really enjoyed was of the uh, you know american table tennis player getting into the chinese bus and uh, that led to the uh, you know entire interplay of events that uh, followed which all of us are very well aware of but not uh, this incident and I think this also uh, kind of highlights that if the soft power is in play, and maybe not intentionally, obviously that player uh, and those both the countries player did not do anything intentionally for uh, for the events that followed, but it enabled the strategic uh, objectives of the U.S. and China as a result of it, right? So even if we don't do things intentionally, but just by the play of soft power, it enables countries, uh, you know, either the military or the uh, or the strategic uh, economic objectives. Uh, oh, doors are open so that is something that i really liked and you have covered it um, with a lot of uh, you know information and insights in various chapters so that was very very interesting and third was uh, that it's very re relatable and uh, the extent that you have traveled that 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 makes the reader pretty jealous but uh, <laughs> so you have traveled quite a lot but anybody who has uh, traveled would be able to relate to those those instances and especially um, i always thought that the first uh, uh, check of country's soft power uh, and its uh, ability is the other country's taxi drivers right because that's th that's the person you talk first to and um, you know and he could make some or the other comment about your uh, country and you have covered that as well and i had my uh, personal instances of uh, you know especially i was really surprised uh, with a taxi driver in texas uh, uh, you know, mentioning to me that he's a big fan of Govinda movies, and I was more surprised about that fan, <laughs> you know, or the Govinda uh, movies than I, because I would have expected Shah Rukh Khan or uh, Amir Khan. But nevertheless, and that uh, that was one. And uh, uh, secondly, I also remembered uh, as a flow of thoughts from there about my meeting with the Pakistanis in uh, in, in in of course in uh, foreign lands, and especially at the airports. And, uh, you know, it's been the uh, warmest interaction. Um, and I think you mentioned uh, in, in your book uh, as well about with the Afghan uh, roommate and the uh, Pakistan. And I think it just like lost brothers, uh, you know, and you connect uh, so easily. Uh, I also uh, was very surprised uh, that in two instances, I was in fact shocked where uh, the Pakistani whom I had just met and I was uh, observing them uh, at a distance, uh, mentioned, identified themselves as Indian to uh, to somebody not the authorities but some other you know either the worker or somebody else they met and that made me think that they feel more comfortable that they will not be judged as you know somebody from a dangerous country or something and they felt comfortable and the indian observing uh, them which was me did not feel offended either so it was definitely not uh, two people from enemy countries uh, you know uh, at all and uh, uh, similarly, uh, in terms of when I was in US, I would prefer going to a Pakistani restaurant than an Indian restaurant because I just loved uh, uh, their way of making, especially the naans, uh, you know, and stuff. And I think, uh, and that is uh, the uh, crux of my question: that uh, if there is one country that uh, can show us proof of the pudding in in terms of soft power, is uh, our relationship uh, normalization with um, uh, so-called our biggest. Uh, uh, enemy and that's um, uh, Pakistan because there's so much um, in common and I don't think so I've met anybody who has said that uh, he was at uh, held collar in, uh, of a person uh, of a Pakistani origin or vice versa because we are enemy countries as the media uh, would make us believe 
and there is a huge, uh, uh, you know, uh, warmth between the two. There's a lot to offer. And I would also like to touch upon this, that we believe that there is, you know, our uh, economic power is more and uh, it's Bollywood, which is very popular in, in uh, Pakistan. But I think it's other way around as well. Uh, that uh, we, I think India has a huge fan following of Pakistan um, media. Uh, you know, media, when I say it in terms of the serials, um, their music. I remember when I was uh, a kid, I probably, uh, some of you might, might not have been born then, but uh, there was this uh, uh, series that we used to get called Bakra Kishtome. It's immensely uh, popular. And then when I was in college, there was this... Uh, uh, music video called Purani Jeans and we were like all crazy about it. It was really, really popular. And now you have these Fawad Khan and uh, all of the world which are like uh, coming and acting. And so there is a huge fan following there. And in terms of cuisine, all people I know who have visited Pakistan. One thing that they swear by is they're, uh, you know, they're going to the local uh, eateries. Uh, and then of course we have cricket, um, which uh, again has been created uh, in, in terms of rivalry. So here's my um, question to you that... Um, and, and by the way, uh, again, you have covered uh, the Indo-Pakistan relation also pretty much in detail, almost going a little bit off uh, the soft power and trying to explain what the whole dynamics is. And which is important in terms of, the, at least for my question, because that uh, you have set the stage for it in the book. Uh, that uh, is it possible that uh, India's, um, uh, you know, a civilian population um, uses soft power to defeat uh, Pakistan's military? I know it's a cross. But uh, because I think uh, for Pakistan to uh, succeed and the way they have been uh, succeeding for their military, as you mentioned in the book, um, needs a lot of support from Indian population and which they have been getting uh, very, very uh, well, right? Uh, and if we withdraw that support, probably we could save some men on the border, um, right? Because their um, objective gets uh, defeated. So um, I want to hear um, your uh, take on, uh, on that. Firstly, Rishi, thank you so much for, for reading the book and for uh, pinpointing instances like this. I mean, as, as someone who's written the book, I think there's no other validation that you can get. Um, <laughs> you know, that yes, I wasn't that. lying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, thank you. Thank you so much. And even your experience, this is what, this, this just makes it all the more interesting, right? When you share your experiences and then you hear somebody else sharing his experiences with you. I think that's the, the reason that you've written the book. Everything just feels... Uh, like you fulfill what you wanted to do. So thank you so much. Uh, with respect to India and Pakistan, um, of course, it's a very <laughs> contentious topic, but um, I think the, the, the reactions that we have right now or the ideas that we have right now are in two extremes. So we have uh, some people going for some of the extreme hardline opinions and you have another section who just says, uh, peace and let's let's work with them and things like that. But ideally, in my opinion, um, I think it needs to be a mix of both. Obviously, at the highest levels, if the government needs to needs to adopt a hardline approach, that's all right. I mean, that that's what they should do. But that should not affect the general people to people relations that both the countries have. So India and Pakistan is just so interesting in the sense that there's a lot of potential for soft power to make an impact in the relationship that that both our countries have. And as you've mentioned, I think. Uh, there's the, the longest chapter in the book is dedicated to this. Uh, the, the, there's just an entire chapter dedicated to this. And again, as you mentioned, I might have gone off topic a little bit in terms of how important, uh, in terms of it, uh, the book covering soft power. But I just felt that this is one place where we should uh, probably hope to have an impact. Right. So, so much has been discussed about um, why both our countries are just completely at odds with each other. And the most logical explanation is obviously, as you mentioned, um, the influence, the outsized influence that uh, the army has in Pakistan. And uh, I think it was Shashi Tharoor who had said, in India, the state has an army. In Pakistan, the army has a state, right? So uh, the military has always called the shots in Pakistan and it has justified um, its power by propagating this doctrine of paranoia uh, with, with regard to India. Right. And um, I am just going to quote uh, Hussein Haqqani, Ambassador Hussein Haqqani, who uh, was invited to uh, Takshashila's uh, webinar a few weeks ago. So I'm just going to quote a line that he has shared. Um, what he says is, Pakistan was not like other countries that raise an army to deal with threats they face. It had inherited a large army that needed a threat if it was to be maintained. And that's quite interesting. He written this in, in his book called India versus Pakistan. And this threat, basically, according to the Pakistani worldview, is India. Right. And uh, 
whenever things have looked positive uh, between india and pakistan we have always seen um, a terrorist attack coming and blowing the entire uh, peace process and uh, stopping it completely so from the kargil intrusion which followed vajpayee's visit to lahore in 1999 to uh, most recently modi had landed in lahore theatrically to greet nawaz sharif on his birthday a few days later we had the patan court terrorist attacks so this this cycle of hope and um, dis- disillusionment that we see with respect to pakistan is just all too familiar um but we shouldn't basically peace is not what the establishment of pakistan wants but that shouldn't stop us from you know working in that direction so some of the things that we should work towards are definitely a more liberal visa regime um the more interactions we have with pakistan is like that you've just mentioned uh, the positive thoughts that you have with pakistanis and that's because you've met them you've you've met them in person you've spoken to them you've had experiences with them and um, i i've had a few myself too so the liberal visa regime would work in the sense that um, it would help us increase the the depth of our interactions with pakistanis because pakistanis typically form their opinions about india uh, through their textbooks um, or even their news channels which are regulated by the military so if we liberalize our regime a uh, visa regime what's going to happen is they will have the opportunity to visit india to interact with indians and this will lead to them softening their uh, deeply held beliefs about india and once that happens uh, moderate opinions about india will spread across pakistani society of course this is a long shot it's going to take years decades probably but it definitely looks better than uh, the current the current block that we are in right now and this is exactly how it's been with the afghans as well um they've been very open with the afghans uh, plenty of afghans who visit india and they have wonderful things to say about india and that's one of the reasons to why we have such a strong relationship with them and i think we can also take um, a leaf out of taiwan's book when it comes to this so taiwan basically there are very few countries in the world that recognize taiwan right and what they have realized is that when relationships are frosty at the highest levels what matters more is citizen exchange and uh, taiwan relies on citizen exchange to uh, for everything basically um, so uh, what some of the things that we can do would be visas we can provide visas to actors singers cricketers not only them but also to people who attract less attention at least i mean even if people ask fawad khan to leave the country that doesn't stop us from inviting a pakistani scientist to india that can happen that can definitely happen uh we can provide them with medical visas medical tourism is something that india has 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 succeeded in uh, doing so we can provide them with medical visas um and there are a lot of shared problems that india and pakistan have together we should look at uh, collaborating our relationships with individual pakistanis and hopefully that will make things better in the future um so uh, the ultimate idea is that we should arrive at a point where we can convince pakistanis or where pakistanis are convinced that they have nothing to fear from india and once that happens the military in pakistan will not be able to justify the influence that they have and i feel that that is a, a possible way to move forward instead of what we see right now thanks thank you rahul thank you rushi uh, one of the virtues of the takshashri line institution is we the engage in diverse opinions so i can very confidently say that i can agree to disagree with both of you and Uh, move on to the next question so uh, i think we are waiting i would like to bring anand into this conversation i uh, is waiting for a very long time anand you have some questions for uh, rahul right yeah yeah great book rahul love the framework around the book itself uh, so i think my this is more in the form of questions some thoughts on uh, uh, which i had when i read the book right uh, so one thing is the scope of what you are talking about in the book is large in terms of the seven eight things that you can actually do to build soft power uh, so one of the thoughts is does it make sense to focus on a country or a set of countries where you have the maximum say return on investment or maximum sort of focus right so if you believe that 30 years later that china is going to be the most influential country in the world and today um, in my mind most of the countries have some strong impression of china positive of india positive or negative but in china i think just purely from an awareness perspective uh, whether a negative or a positive narrative in in my head it's missing in 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 a large way they don't really know anything about us right uh, so is that one kind of approach to take is one of the thoughts right uh, does it make sense to figure out uh, work with one country and sort of get a strong sense on how do you sort of focus and is that one approach towards building a uh, soft power uh the second piece was uh, want to understand how you think of soft power as a tool because 
uh, in some sense, some of these things, right, uh, you can wield it in different ways, right? Uh, the way from what I can make from the book, you have thought of software as primarily a positive tool, right? Uh, but some of the things that you're talking about, say narratives in general, right, can be wielded both ways. So uh, is, it, is it in some sense another arena as well when you wield it with other countries that along with military or with economic ways of exercising power, is that another way of doing it? So one is you uh, create a positive impression about India itself, but also uh, is in your mind creating a negative impression about other countries part of what this is all about? Is it also in other arena as well? Uh, the third thing is um, in your mind, who are sort of the key stakeholders who play a large role here? Uh, from uh, in my head, a lot of the initiatives around this are actually led by the government. The government creates either becomes a facilitator or an enabler, and then a lot of that happens at a people to people level. Um, what can I mean? There are, there are forty-five people watching this webinar, right? So. Uh, what can any of them do to bring India up in the, you know, among the top 30, which we are not, right? So I'm probably, those are actually stuff, things on my mind when I read the book. So I wanted to run that by you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Um, you had mentioned negative and positive software. And I think that is something that's very valid uh, because software can be negative as well. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, a troll, a troll is <laughs> negative software. Right. So, uh, yeah, you can have positive and negative, but the idea should not be to, um, like, basically the best form of propaganda is not to have any propaganda at all. So we're not trying to uh, create a story that, that doesn't exist. Right? We focus on boosting all the individual software sources that we have, uh, like, like Bollywood and like tourism, focus on them individually. And when it comes to engaging with a particular country, we can harness some of those sources. Like, for example, uh, just like what Jaswant Singh had done when he visited Afghanistan, uh, he distributed tapes of Bollywood music there. But the groundwork was already done. Bollywood was already so popular in Afghanistan. What he was doing was just using something that was already established uh, to engage with the citizens of another country. So that should be the approach, I think. Um, we boost the multiple sources of software that we have. And depending on the, the context that we find ourselves in, we can uh, decide how to harness those uh, tools of software accordingly. And uh, you had also spoken about uh, who really has the power uh, to, to, to harness software, right? So I think um, what is the, the key differentiator between soft power and hard power is the role that the government plays. Uh, when we talk about the military, the military is entirely uh, controlled by the government. Um, the economy likewise is at least steered by it. When it comes to soft power, there is relatively little that the government can do compared to the economy and the military. Sure, I mean, uh, as you mentioned, the government should step in to facilitate an environment that, that promotes interactions or uh, that, that sort of boosts multiple sources of software. But overall, there are limits to what a government can do. Um, and the best example for this is China, basically. Um, China has, over the last many years, spent billions of dollars to boost their global image. But you can argue that it probably hasn't resulted in what they would ideally want. Um, these, especially in uh, after COVID, you could argue again that China is probably not um, seen as trustworthy as, um, as, 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 as they used to be. I mean, you could argue that basically. Um, so clearly government, there is a lot that the government can do, but there are also a lot of limitations there. Um, most of the heavy lifting when it comes to software would have to be performed at the societal level. So um, actors, scientists, uh, sports persons, businessmen, universities, and, and individuals as well. Um, uh, I think she had mentioned uh, the gesture of sportsmanship that, uh, that was done in 1971 that completely changed, uh, or that had a huge impact on the India-Pakistan war. Uh, likewise, people like Amir Khan, people like Govinda, as she had mentioned, uh, these are all individuals. These are people operating in their individual capacities, and they help to boost our image abroad. So um, overall, I would say that there are limits to what the government uh, can achieve when it comes to software. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul. I, would, I just have five minutes, I think five to six minutes. So I would like to bring the audience into the discussion. Uh, I have one interesting question uh, from the audience. It's an anonymous question, I think. Uh, on China. So you in your conversation mentioned China. So looking at things that China is doing right now, uh, especially related to Uyghurs, especially related to Tibetans, 
how do you see the role of china soft power and how do they manifest their soft power in the world do you have any insights on that sure sure so um there was this book that was written by two colonels in the people's liberation army china's army and what they had written in the book it's called unrestricted warfare and what they had written was basically china, they accepted that china has a huge military inferiority vis-a-vis the us and china should focus more on the other tools uh, that 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 serves its strengths for example a propaganda in their case or cyber terrorism or uh, the economy obviously so i think if we look at how china has has gone about um, narrowing that gap with other countries um, we we can probably take a lot of uh, learnings from that as well uh, we in india could make up for our weaknesses uh, with respect to uh, some or with respect to even china right, by employing a broader range of soft power instruments so the idea is that let's say i mean uh, the talk right now is about india and china um, at the border and what can we do what are our options and unfortunately um, when it comes to military or economic options we are constrained right um, so what might uh, work or what might actually have an impact is our soft power resources so for example if we are able to boost our soft power and strengthen relationships with citizens in other countries uh, world opinion is going to be on our side and when it comes to war one of the most important considerations that a country needs to make is how the world will perceive its actions and if we will be trusted more uh, it isn't going to be very easy for uh, it isn't going to be very straightforward for china to attack india likewise likewise if um, the average chinese citizen has a positive perception of india um, what will, what would happen is that it would not be straightforward again for the chinese government to shove propaganda targeted at india to influence them um, so once again soft power could play a role in uh, sort of hampering the legitimacy that the communist party's actions can have so um, engaging better with the average chinese citizen could actually serve as a way for us to uh, narrow the gap between india and china the idea is that uh, we can probably come up with ideas but but i think one of the uh, aims that i had when i wrote the book was that we should at least start these conversations because the conversations right now are solely uh, confined to uh, our military or economic options and we don't really have much going for us when it comes to china uh, in that regard um, but what if soft power is part of the conversation then we can possibly explore uh, what we can do to boost our soft power resources and to engage them uh, with respect to china thanks rahul i just have one more question i think it's asked by smita before we call it a day i think her question is on uh, the inequality that is existent in india right now and what it portrays for the world will that hamper or is that hampering india's soft power right now the economic inequality disparity in india right now what uh, how is it portrayed by the world yes uh, the answer is definitely yes so and i think it's essential that uh, we look at soft power in addition to military and economic power so for example greater economic power would help you generate the resources that you need for soft power right so um, in india unfortunately it is going to take a while for us to reach the standards that uh, other developed countries have so this isn't something that we can solve uh, right now it's going to take a long time but as our economy strengthens and as hopefully if uh, as our per capita income increases Uh, we will have it, it will automatically boost our soft power as well so there is a link there there is definitely a link likewise um, a stronger economy basically helps you invest in a stronger military a stronger military again generates the soft power that you would require uh, to appear strong in front of the world so they're all linked uh, they're not exactly uh, distinct from each other so as for uh, inequality i think that is definitely something negative that we have but um we also there isn't much that we can do about it at this point so we should rather focus on the areas that uh, we have a lot going for us and uh, hopefully in time aspects such as inequality would get much better thank you thank you rahul thank you all the attendees panelists discussion i want to thank all the panelists all our discussants the takshashila institution and most importantly our audience for this wonderful conversation that we had on soft power and india's soft power in forwarding india's national interest 
thank you all for joining us on a friday evening this is certainly not the last deep webinar that we are going to have on how to forward india's national interest in fact we are working on two sets of webinar first as you can see on your screen we invite you to a webinar on covid-19 vaccine deployment strategy for india on the upcoming wednesday the main purpose of this webinar would be to discuss the important challenges posed by the unprecedented scale of vaccine development and to chart the way forward for india the second set of webinars that we have in the future for you is on india's neighborhood challenge this set of webinars investigate on india's interaction with the less ex less explored neighbors in the subcontinent and southeast asia we have completed one in the series which was on sri lanka and the next in queue will be on myanmar we will shortly update you with all the details so please do join us for both sets both sets of webinar uh, thank you everyone and have a great weekend thank you thank you thank you so much thank you